Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Biden time with all of us. Welcome to Biden time. I, as always, am Christian Blatt. Uh, down there in the center square is the one and only Mr. Scott Moore. Uh, hopefully, hey guys. Uh, Tamara will be with us shortly. She's experiencing some tech issues. Uh, and I'm uh, very excited to have uh, back on the show, but for the first time on this iteration of the show. Al Greg, how are you, sir? Doing great. Happy to be here. Good to be here. Yeah, before it was a Trump re report, now it's Biden time. I like that. Yeah, look, it's, uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I, at some point the world changes and then the, the names of very important shows need to change as well. Uh, and uh, Al, it's uh, fantastic to see you. And there's, uh, there's a lot to talk about in the news today. Um, I wanted to start with, uh, well, look, for, for a second, just to tell people uh, very quickly a little bit about yourself. Uh, you have a couple of uh, films out there, uh, I know, too. So uh, just uh, for people... For people who, for some reason, didn't catch the uh, season four after show of Better Call Saul and remember us uh, working together, uh, yeah. this is the reteaming of the Bavarian Boys. So, the Bavarian uh, Boys. <laughs> very exciting. Uh, yeah. Tell people a little bit about yourself, and then we'll uh, we'll kind of dive into a few of the things we're going to talk about hey, this week. Great. Hey, you guys. In addition to uh, partnering with Christian on some really good, you know, podcasts and after shows, you know, just um, being a film junkie. Uh, I am a filmmaker, specifically a, a documentary filmmaker. Uh, one of my, my current project right now, Occupy Black, is actually virtually screening, as they say. Uh, I recently received a grant from the LA Department of Cultural Affairs. And what they did for, a, this was during COVID, and it was for artists who specifically showed, I guess, using their art form to help benefit the community, health-wise during COVID, during the pandemic, as well as socially and politically, obviously with a lot of the unrest, that's where uh, my film falls under. And specifically it's under uh, the category of, uh, of uh, songs for freedom. So if anybody would like to go and uh, check it out and uh, screen this first iteration of my uh, feature film, this first chapter, I'm sorry, let me clarify. It's called Songs for Revolution. That's the category it's under. And you can just go to culture.org slash reimagine culture.org slash reimagine uh it's under reimagine public art and under songs for the revolution occupy black i know that's kind of wordy but there you go <laughs> yeah but you, you tell people where you can find it and uh oh, for, okay, great. Uh, obviously yeah. people people see on the screen uh they yeah. see occupyblack.com uh so uh well uh yesterday uh, president biden spoke uh in tulsa talking to uh commemorate the uh 100th anniversary of the i i mean there's a there's a lot of the, it's, it's always referred to as riots but uh it really seems like it, it, it doesn't seem like it was really a massacre is what it's it was a great massacre yeah yeah and um i we talked about this uh that incident on the show uh, a few years ago and i was very honest about i had no idea that that had ever happened i never heard anything about it i think a lot of people uh know more about it the last couple of years because the first episode of hbo's watchmen mm -hmm. they talk about it and and it, they show it but that's a reality where in the comic books at least in watchmen like richard nixon's president for 20 years mm -hmm. you know so i just assumed it was made up for this world and then it's like no this really happened mm -hmm. and you know i was talking with somebody on facebook uh who grew up in that area uh and it, it's worth mentioning it, it's it's a white guy i know in the area and they all knew about it they they definitely know about it and it's so it's interesting uh, you know, but uh, it's just not something. I grew up in New York State. I never heard about it. Scott, you grew up in Florida. I assume uh, you're 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 shaking your head. You didn't know anything nope. about it. Didn't know anything uh, about it. Like you said, it was Watchmen, and I thought, oh, yeah, it's part of a. Uh, it just seemed. It, it's like fashion. it had to be made up mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. it's such a terrible thing, and it's so hard to believe. Um, so. Al, I think that's, a, you know, the, the fact that, you know, and, and President Biden spoke very strongly about it uh, yesterday, you know, just about what a terrible thing it, it, it was. And uh, there there were some there are still some survivors from there. I mean, because it, you know, it was 100 years ago. So, you, you know, you have some people who were, were children at that point. Uh, so just talk a little bit about it and, uh, you know, uh, why you think it's it's such an important thing to talk about. And remember that on the one hand, 100 years is a long time but it's uh, far too short a time for something like that to have happened. And, you know, essentially, uh, you know, uh, no, no one was arrested, you know? Uh, so uh, talk a little bit about it, please. 
Yeah, um, I mean, and thank God for shows like The Watchmen, while the uh, depiction obviously wasn't totally historical, but thank God for putting the conversation of Tulsa back on the map to the mainstream, because that's pretty much, you know, what they did for, for most of us in the black community, um, or I don't know, I come from a family of educators and historians, uh, so my family is very well aware of it. It's kind of like the whole thing with Juneteenth, you know, some people know of it, or it's like, I think Scott was from the South, you know, he might have known of it, but everybody doesn't doesn't know these things but you know my family you know it was uh something that was always mentioned for those who don't know in short uh in Tulsa Oklahoma Greenwood was this very prominent black community and not just a uh, residencies but homeowners black businesses black banks and these were things that were all destroyed like uh uh, Christian said it wasn't a riot. It was a massacre. And it was really it was an act of domestic terrorism. Let's call it what it is. And it's interesting because we're, I was just watching this other uh, uh, this other debate. And it's funny how, you know, if you talk about Americans being attacked on American soil by terrorism, like in 911, they have no problem coming up with uh, reparations. Only there they call it a, a victim's compensation fund. But it's really the same thing. So you wouldn't think twice. It's all these people, you know, they, they need to be made whole. But these people, uh, these uh, residents and their descendants in Greenwood are still struggling to get compensation and reparations. And I think it's, it, that's a whole other word we can get to. But I guess the point is uh, the reason there's such a need for it. And I got to give Biden props for just at least broaching the subject because he wouldn't even broach it before. Matter of fact, Trump, you know, kind of characterized it in the opposite way last year. But because it was generational wealth that was destroyed. Because when you want to destroy a community of people, you destroy them economically. That's how you destroy the future generations to come. So when you talk about, you know, for instance, these banks being destroyed, where did that wealth go? Where, where, where did those assets go? Aside from there being no investigation on where a lot of that property went, because we know a lot of that property was co-opted and usurped, of course, the only replacement were white banks at the time. So you're forced to put your money back in those white financial institutions. So think of all the money that was just, you know, and wealth that was just straight up stolen, not to mention the trauma. So while Biden was speaking, you know, you thank goodness for the activists out there, you know, who are still protesting uh, for reparations. You saw an, a woman who was over 100 years old, you know, testify in the news, you know, how she still smells the smoke and, and, and traumatized and the, the tricky thing about Biden, where I'm, I'm trying not to be cynical, is I think it actually, I got to give him, like I said, some uh, uh, somewhat of a high mark for mentioning it. Because the problem is wh what you notice is when you mention something, then you can't deny it. Then you Now that you put it out there in the open in the mainstream, now we can start talking about accountability. And Biden's historically been anti-reparations uh, for a lot of things concerning, for mostly everything specifically com uh, uh, concerning the black community. Not, there's other discussions we can have, but, but particularly for descendants of African-American slaves. So the fact that he mentioned it, I guess, is a good start. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you, far be it from uh, any of us to tell anyone how they should feel. But uh, the fact that, it, you know, he went there to commemorate it and you know, it, it, it wouldn't have even been seen as passing the buck if he sent Kamal Harris there, you know, but I think it was important that the president of the United States uh, goes there, you know, and I mean, it was uh, Biden's exact words yesterday were that this was not a riot. This was a massacre. And, uh, you know, there there's definitely a, an, an issue to just sort of erase it. And I think the it being the 100th anniversary uh, really, you know, leads itself to you know, this is a, this is a, there, there's always a good time to talk about it. And I think that when you run into reparations, you can, you can, and we'll certainly talk more about that. You can make the case for descendants of slaves and, you know, uh, it might be harder to sort of trace it back. This is fairly, this is with, within the last century. So you're only dealing with a, a couple of generations. And like you said, there's someone who lived through it there. So uh, the, the fact that, uh, that this wrong happened so long ago. I mean, it's uh, it, it is good to talk about it and and start the conversation, but you then have to continue the conversation and uh, follow through on it. Scott, I wanted to uh, let you weigh into uh, President Biden, you know, making this trip and not uh, talking about it yesterday. Well, I was going to say it's it's twofold too. It's the first sitting president 
to go and visit and and acknowledge this. And second, secondarily, I think that his speech was pretty passionate too, um, and, and and pretty forceful, and and not you know just doing the usual smooth talking presidential type speech. He really kind of dug into it, and he also was correlating things today, a hundred years later, that are still not where we should be, and and had taken that through line from you know this massacre 100 years ago to things that had happened in the past 50 years to you know what's going on today um and so i thought that was also important to just acknowledge that we still have a long ways to go and um and i was very impressed actually by uh, the forcefulness of the speech um you know he was calling out people and i mean he didn't call out uh, joe manchin and kirsten cinema by name but he basically called them out for all intents and purposes of, in the senate um saying that even though it's not 100 percent true about them voting more with republicans but you know saying that there's still a lot of issues and that this this voting rights act needs to pass and and um you know I, I, so it was it was very important on a couple levels one like you said acknowledging a sitting president that actually went there and two to be able to kind of connect it to today and 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 forcefully say we have a lot of work to do still, I think was important for people to hear that as well. It's not just commemorating a, a, a terrible moment in, in history that has been, you know, whitewashed, uh, truthfully, but also saying that it's still ongoing today. And there's still things from the past that are, are connecting it to today as well. Yeah. And, and I definitely want to circle back on reparations, but uh, since, you know, this part of the conversation came up, it, it was something that was uh, appointed to Kamala Harris uh, yesterday that sort of, mm -hmm. you know, she's going to be uh, in charge of these voting rights. And we're hearing about some of these laws on the state levels, Al, uh, and the perception you know, uh, completely outside of uh, the black community. I mean, I read about this and I'm like, okay, so they're making it harder for black people to vote. And I could be, I, I, I could be, well, maybe it's not as simple as that, but that's my takeaway, you know, Florida, Texas, and, and uh, some of these other laws. Uh, and I, I wanted to know sort of your perception, you know, as you're hearing about these, yeah. these laws that are, are not going to get passed on the federal level, Right. But uh, in some of these states, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ron DeSantis, I believe, uh, made it made a point. Well, no, no, that's a separate issue. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 there's something I'm going to put on him that is uh, along with it, is something else that we're celebrating uh, this month. But it's not that. So uh, but his state, Texas, they want to pass this legislation. Uh, so uh, I wanted to get your thoughts, you know, on, on what you think when you hear this and uh, just what you feel can actually be done about it. Right, and okay, and specifically you brought up Texas, that's a good example. What they wanna do is limit extended early voting hours. In this democracy, you think it's a good thing for people to vote, as many people to, to get out the vote as possible to, be, to, represent, you know, uh, to represent their community and exercise their constitutional right to vote. But they wanna limit the hours of voting. They want to ban drive-through voting. This is all in Texas, which makes again makes it easier to vote. They want to establish more poll watchers, which we know historically we need poll watchers. But historically, what you uh, what the Republicans and the GOP have uh, uh, who've stationed at these poll uh, polling stations, where people were very intimidating. Some of them bearing Confederate flags, almost went there, which really with the presence to not only intimidate but prevent you to voting, and often armed. Uh, so it had it's it's a very um, it's a very they they play a lot with uh, I guess with the right to with the white right to monitor votes versus with the right to intimidate and where you cannot even proactively send mail in applications. One of the things we all discovered during COVID and this affects all community, but largely you see these things uh, largely impacting uh, the black and brown community most was being able to send in, you know, these mail-in ballots, not wanting to go and, and make these ballots and you make the, you know, deliver them in person. These are the exact things, you know, that the GOP is trying to limit. And I'm just going to give a, another quick example. Um, one of their big things is purging. It's been a fight to get across the states uh, to, to basically, you know, for felons to basically get, you know, their voting rights back. But uh, and, the, and the Republicans have always fought against it, that we know, but they're expanding these purging laws to all types of really uh, 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 to crimes, to lower crimes. And what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, not um, non felony based crimes. The, this purging, this purging uh, thing they're going on is, is really incredible. And if you look at what happened, particularly in the South, 
uh, during the last election, you had tens of thousands of voters who waited in hour long lines, missing work and obligations. And oftentimes we, th we think these voting hours were intentionally limited because they wanted to limit it to access to voting in the black community. But it's, it, to me, it really it translates to largely disenfranchising them or of their right to vote or trying to. And I think uh, Stacey Abrams is one of the people who's, uh, who's obviously been really been an advocate of that. I think we need to you know, fight to maintain you know, these, uh, the ability to uh, early registration, absentee. Now they're making it in over 30 states, the GOP, in over 30 states where you have to have some type of an excuse to vote absentee. When in all, when in all practical purposes, you know, we've never needed an excuse. I've never needed. If you want to vote absentee, because you're absentee, or where you need to send in second forms of a uh, second forms of identification. Again, all targeted at black communities. So these are things that we need to uh, to fight against. And uh, what, what I think people commonly refer to them as, you know, Jim Crow type uh, legislation. Yeah, no, absolutely. And sorry, uh, tech problems abounding today, but uh, I'm glad that uh, I was able to pop back in here. Uh, yeah, and I think that uh, it, it seems very calculated to do this when an election went the way that uh, one party very specifically didn't like. And the fact that there is all this uh, legislation uh, tells you that uh, they know very much that uh, the system uh, just worked against them, so they need to change the system. And uh, mm -hmm. we can we can talk about uh, you know recounts and uh, audits and all that stuff as much as we want, but uh, that's why they're changing this legislation. Uh, Scott, in terms of these uh, state laws, is it possible to supersede them at the federal level? And if it is, it, I assume it would involve more than sixty votes in the Senate, right? Well, that's exactly it, you know, and that's why Biden was stressing yesterday the importance of, of getting this this act passed. And it's either you have to get rid of the filibuster uh, to do that. And that's why he was calling out Joe Manchin and, and, and Kristen Sinema. But um, and that would supersede these these state laws. And and like to Al's point, I mean, th this is all done um, from losers. Um, these are losers that know that they are going to lose if they don't do whatever they can to restrict voting. And, and a healthy democracy would do the opposite. A healthy democracy would allow as much open convenience ability to have their citizens participate when it comes to voting. So the BS that they're using for these excuses um, just doesn't come to pass, like saying, oh, we, we have to, you know, uh, make sure that that everything is, you know, safe and, and there's integrity, but it's BS. When you're restricting voting on Sundays to after 1 p.m. to after church, mm. you're doing that for a very specific reason. And it's Thank absolutely- Thank you for mentioning special. that, Scott. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you because that was one thing I neglected to bring, but mm -hmm. historically the black community has uh, gotten out the vote based around church organization, mm -hmm. obviously back to you know Martin Luther King, you know, SCLC, uh, and our, a lot of our mobilization is based around the church, getting people there early, driving people to the polls, mm -hmm. and basically cutting the days in half to those community where these black churches are the most prominent. So, uh, yeah, well said. Yeah, it's 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 just a naked attempt uh, to hold on to power, and again, that's what losers do uh, when they're not winning. And uh, so that's why it's important to get this federally at the level. And, and like we've talked about, I know our, our good friend Chelsea from here in the past on our, our on our podcast would also agree getting that dark money out is, is some of the biggest problems that we have in politics and we need to get that out too. So, you know, there's a lot more work to do, but if this federal law could pass, uh, then we can make some of those uh, initial changes and, you know, prevent uh, this type of like hostile takeover by a minority government uh, that doesn't like the fact that they're losing elections. And as we've talked about time and time again, they're going to continue to get a, a smaller portion of the population. So they can keep trying to, to whittle away at what they can and hold it as long as they can. But we saw already Georgia went blue. We see what's going to happen in Texas down the line. We see what's going to happen in Florida, North Carolina. We saw it in Arizona already that a lot of these states now in the Sun Belt are going to be trending Democratic and will stay that way as, as also Virginia did in the past decade. So they are going to continue to lose. And overall, the, the strategy for them to try to hold on to power is going to get harder and harder for them um, because they're just not going to have the numbers anymore as we move forward this decade. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think that uh, it's, you know, they're doing what they can while they still have, I guess, the, the power that they do have, you know, and, uh, 
you know, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a lot to question about, you know, what systems are in place, uh, you know, sure, next year for midterm elections, but especially for 2024 with the next uh, presidential election. Uh, so, Al, uh, I did want to, uh, I did want to, I did want to circle back to uh, talking about reparations, and I think it's uh, you know something that we've spoken about a little bit on the show, but because it's not, as you said, not something that Biden speaks a lot about, and they're, you know, trying to not say one way or the other how he feels about it in relation to you know descendants of uh, the the Greenwood, the Tulsa victims. Uh, talk a little bit about it, just sort of big picture and uh you know the 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 reasons for it that maybe people don't quite understand you know i think uh that a lot of people can grasp the concept but maybe not understand why there's this feeling that there's such a need for it you know in, within the black community right and and specifically both you and scott brought up some some very valid concerns about about the execution but for instance all black people want, you know, we don't sit here for the most part, and we're not trying to sit here and mince uh, the uh, and divide up and parse who's black and who's not. If you have a if you have a, a drop of descendants of a, of chattel slavery in your valid, so most there are records that they can find, you know, uh, uh, as far as like plantations. Uh, some of these records were disappeared, but records were kept. And I don't have a problem. Most people don't have a problem. I remember referring to you like ADOS or a, a Foundational Black American. Uh, these are like kind of like online movements for reparations, where none of these uh, none of these uh, organizations get caught up in the distinction of, of tracing who. But more importantly, a lot of the uh, pushback sometimes come back comes from, I well I wasn't there. That wasn't me. I didn't do anything wrong. Well, you don't even have to necessarily get it from you. There's numbers of a uh, multi uh, multi uh, financial institutional banks and corporations whose legacy is, is whose financial legacy is based off slavery not to mention cotton so these are things that can easily be documented and more and I guess more importantly too and people another uh, excuse you here as well you know it would be financially impossible if we're talking about you know let's say trillions of dollars the government, Every every time, as we know, there's some type of uh, drop in the stock market or, or global event. We come back and we bail out the banks every time because they're quote too big to fail. It's, and, and Obama did it too. And I think if we're going to shell out trillions of dollars every 10 years, that's not going to break the economy to perhaps distribute a few trillion dollars, just like it would be just like a stimulus, just like a recovery bill, you know, to African-Americans over time and it's not really and even in my opinion it's not really anyone's place to tell them what they do with it it's more like the dis the those who are receiving it you know the descendants of american slaves to uh to discuss it among themselves how and where they receive it you know Ma uh, martin luther king was very famous very famous for his cut the check speech where he talked about again millions giving to uh white farmers and in, in the in the midwest but when it came to to, uh, to uh, restitution, you know, for uh, for black descendants of slavery, there was always uh, there was always these challenges. So I think uh, the word uh, reparations for some people it brings poorly. But I brought up the the victims' compensation fund, you know, with nine one one and uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, links I may or may not have sent you, uh, 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 Christian, but it's this uh, wonderful uh, Jewish woman who's talking about how her as uh, how we. Uh, and she and her family was paid restitution, you know, for the Holocaust and kept emphasizing, you know, how important cash payments are specifically. And then she was on with Gail King and Gail King came in and shut her down the minute she started talking about that. And I'm going to tell you why. And I'd love for people to go, go revisit that if you can look it up. Uh, the Gail King conversation on reparations, she was talking with the uh, descendant of the Holocaust whose descent, you know, obviously descendants in her family were, were uh, eligible. And I agree with that. Um, what you see a lot of times in the mainstream press, particularly black mainstream press, unfortunately down uh, to the black caucus is not wanting to politically take that on. Obama swerved and dodged that question every time reparations came up. 
Kamala Harris, when confronted about reparations, let me tell you what she did. There's this great clip, and I use it in my film, Occupy Black. It's not in this first chapter that's streaming now, but it'll be one of the forthcoming chapters. When confronted about reparations for descendants of slavery, Kamala Harris started laughing, that weird nervous laugh. <laughs> well, I'm not just going to give reparations and compensation to my own people. When that's what America is about, is giving compensation and making hold to Japanese who were wrongfully interred down to, uh, you know, Jewish Americans. And a lot of it's being, you know, a lot of it's, you could even say it, a lot of it's being uh, uh, funneled through support through the state of Israel, which I support because these were people who were displaced. We're talking about the very end of the Holocaust. And as for some reason, it's only with African Americans, you know, we could talk about the victims of 911 and domestic slavery, but for some reasons with African Americans, Tulsa, the prime example, why it's so complicated. And it, and it really burns me up. And I think politically, this is our part, and wrap it up with this, politically, the Black Caucus, people like Kamala Harris, Obama, and uh, specifically Gail King, who represent, we call these the gatekeepers, the Black mainstream gatekeepers, not who represent, you know, the majority of, you know, of, of, uh, of the Black consensus, but the media gatekeepers who are empowered by the MSNBCs and get paid by these and have a vested interest, you know, in working with the Democrats, uh, always skirt the issue because it's not in their financial benefit, you know, and it, and it's, and it feels too complicated and, and too selfish when the America was built on basically, uh, if someone has been disproportionately and directly wrong, you specifically and disp disproportionately address that problem. You don't make it well, the way it's currently worded in a lot of the bills for reparations that Biden claims or the administration or Kamala claims is toward reparations. Well, it's for everybody. You know, it's for it's the Obama lift all boats. We're going to get, you know, people of color. Great. Uh, we're going to get uh, low income. That can be low income whites, low income blacks. We can get the LGBT uh, community. Great. Uh, we can get all these people, you know, who are, who have been, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Marginalized the uh, the uh, those who are um, those who are uh, disabled, all great things, but they always use George Floyd and black people and slavery as the marketing tool. This is who we're giving. Look at all this. This is so bad. Black Lives Matter. And then when you read the fine print, we're getting divided up, you know, with like a, an eighth of what supposedly you know we're entitled to get. In my opinion, when everybody else gets targeted reparations and compensation, does that make sense? No, it definitely makes sense. And uh, a point you made earlier, you know, it's like, well, you know, I, I've never uh, owned slaves and my grandfather didn't. Yeah, but, you know, some people's great, great grandfathers did. They're also not asking you to write a check right now. You know, yes, there's uh, questions about, you know, what this does to, you know, our, our federal deficit, our budget. You, you can ask those questions, but you're not actually paying out on some wrongdoing that may actually have happened in your family, may not have. So, you know, it's not you directly doing it. It's just sort of figuring out how do you set up a fund like this and how do you do it? Scott, I wanted to uh, ask you sort of politically, uh, you know, that Kamala Harris clip that you're talking about, I do remember that. That's mm -hmm. almost like, you know, you're you're talking to, you know, a, a, a girl who's like, yeah, my friends tell me you like me. <laughs> That's so mm -hmm. funny. Why would they think that I like you? Because obviously we're just friends, right? Yeah, it was so uncomfortable. It was like very like junior high kind of laugh that she did. But to her credit, she doesn't know what to say about it. She's like, yeah, look, that's such a calculated thing. You got to roll it out the right way. Uh, what do you think, Scott, in terms of like politically how do you address this? And, you know, why do you think, uh, obviously, so many, uh, you know, even even uh, even uh, politicians of African-American uh, heritage are just like, you know, like Obama is so inclined to just stay away from it? Well, again, it's it's twofold. You both kind of brought it up already. One is that, you know, getting to the work to actually figure out what is the cost? How much is it? Where is it coming from? You know, there have been a couple of states that have, have kind of looked into that. So that that's one thing, just financially, nobody wants to go in and actually roll up their sleeves and do the hard work. And then I would say secondarily, you know, and it's sad, but there's a political side to it. And it does make me really sad that, that when we had President Obama here that had the opportunity to really speak on this and move it forward, and same thing with Vice President Harris, 
there's a political concern that they don't want to alienate moderate white Democrats, um, which, you know, instead of taking that risk and putting themselves out there and really moving forward on things, instead they take the comfortable, easy one and not really answer or not really move forward because they feel that they're going to alienate those white Democrats uh, that are more moderate, uh, that are a little bit more conservative, and that they know go out and vote. And um, so it, it's sad that it comes down to that, but there is a political reason as to why they've kind of skirted this issue. And in a way, why to some degree it was easier and, and more important, obviously, to have the president there yesterday in Tulsa, but to be able to have, you know, the, the old white guy optically there as president rather than him sending in the vice president to, you know, optically be like, okay, now we're, we're sending out, you know, the black woman to, to this event. So it, there, there's twofold. It's one, they don't, nobody's really put in the hard work to really analyze what that would be financially. And two, it's, it's down to politics, which is sad, but that's part of the reason why they, they didn't do it. Yeah, can I jump right? You got to jump in here, Christian, before I forget. Absolutely. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. And back to Biden, too, when you guys, when we all agreed that it was a good speech, the biggest concern with Biden is guess what? Is that it's not lip service which is what we often get. The same thing with the discussion of reparations, HR 40, mm -hmm. which has been languishing, I believe, since the 70s. That's what we're worried about is, is lip mm -hmm. service, which is what a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, special interest groups, communities, even uh, uh, cultures, races complain they get, but also to a lot of that goes back to leverage too. And uh, mm -hmm. which leads me back to a, um, another thing I, I think you, you addressed. We were talking about um, Okay, why there's not reparations uh, and specifically target? I want. I wanted to say too, for the record, I, everybody knows me. Knows you guys know this. I support all those marginalized groups I've mentioned. I would be the first one to go out there, take a sign, you know, and support each and every one of their rights. But at the same time, I wouldn't. Uh, and this is a problem that this is kind of controversial, but leads to the black a problem. Problem why Black Lives Matter is again not getting a lot of the support and the leaders stepped down recently, as you guys know, Patrice Cullors from, as we say, the Black Street or the non mainstream Black community. For Black Lives Matter and Patrice Cullors, Cullors really a very talented woman and her three Black women founders really tapped into something. They took a hashtag, there's argument whether they uh, invented it or not, but they took it and they, and they also registered it and they incorporatized it and did these great things with other people couldn't do, which in the movements need organization. But part of the critique was not just the lack of transparency, but guess what? When you look at a lot of the um, uh, finances where, because they don't reveal their finances, they don't reveal a, a line item of their 5013C, they go through another finance 5013C called the thousands or their work with the Tides Foundation. And when you look at, where those money goes, <laughs> funneling it through, uh, funneling it through those other organizations. You know, these are organ cor corporations that are giving them millions of dollars, and obviously, you know, they want uh, as as supporters, their agenda needs to be recognized. They're going to put the Act Blue uh, link on their website, which Patrice kind of uh, dodged the question and said there was no ties to Act Blue, but. Act Blue was a, a Democratic special interest group, which basically went to get Kamala and Biden elected. And that was on their website saying, if you want to support Black Lives yeah. Matter, support them. So basically, a lot of the money was, and this is again mentioned in my film, was while uh, not accounted for or not as transparency, the path of it, but was going through mainstream Democrat organizations, not strictly to Blacks, and as well as the Tides Foundation, as I mentioned, and uh, the thousands more just more general uh, people of color, liberal uh, organizations, not targeting the black community, if that makes sense. And then that's been kind of like a general theme. I'm trying to no, yeah, that, uh, that that absolutely makes sense. And, you know, you you did go through, you know, all of the not all of you <laughs> went through a bunch of wrongs. You know, I mean, the the Japanese-American internment camps during World War II is such a 
crazy thing to think about. And obviously what we as a government did to Native Americans, you know, there are some degrees of uh, make good on that. You know, it's like, oh, well, you can have casinos. Does that make up for it? No, no, actually it doesn't. But mm -hmm. thank you, by the way. Uh, but no, we, you know, so yeah. And it's, uh, I, I think that I wonder how much of it is, is the fear of like, we got a lot to answer for and we're going to go broke if we, uh, if we make up for all of our mistakes, but there is a way to address this and just sort of figuring out the way to do it. Uh, I guess, you know, that's, that's, that's really what the focus is on. And I think, Look, uh, Kamala Harris got appointed to uh, dealing with the voting rights because that's something that uh, she can handle. It wasn't like, OK, you're in charge of reparations now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I don't know what happens next. It, you know, in terms of talking about smaller steps, Al, what would be a good next step? OK, it's not going to be what everybody wants, but what would be like, OK, we feel like they're listening. We feel we hope that this isn't the only thing we get. Mm -hmm. But what would be? The next thing that would make would be sort of a good faith of like, okay, they're listening and hopefully they continue in this direction. Right. And I'm going to put on my political hat <laughs> because uh, I've had problems with the HR 40 bill, which has been languishing, you know, since, you know, John Conyers uh, back in the day and, and uh, the black caucus. And I believe Sheila Jackson Lee's is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is governing over, you know, that particular legislation right now that's gone the farthest mainstream as far as legislation. And last time it even was, she was even able to bring it before the Congress. It was only for a conversation. And the minute they tried to move on that, move beyond that, it was shut down. It had no votes. They had no political leverage. But because that's the one on the table is HR 40, one of the things that groups like ADOS and FBA, who I was referring to, are just trying to even get them to fix it, to address the, uh, the language in it, if we want true reparations, because for some people, this may be make it less politically attainable. But for me, it's an improvement. If you're if you're authentically wanting to address the problem, the language is unclear as far as like, you know, it's going to black people. It talks about this big discussion of slave of slavery and then it goes into black people. But it doesn't particularly address when you get down to the wire, who's compensated the descendants of black American slaves and the language is, is really muddy. So, you know, that can be, you know, I think every every group who suffered, whether they be a black immigrant from Africa or Cuba, we have many uh, Afro uh, Latinos, everyone needs to be, to be supported and I'll be the first one, you know, to go and help them. I'll go and help, in my opinion, I'll go and march for you in Cuba, help you get your representatives. I'll go and march for you in Puerto Rico, help you get your representatives. I'll, I'll definitely go and help that group and fight my hardest to help you get reparations from the uh, government or the entity that exploited you. But, um, you know, that's not, I feel like that's not necessarily the, the case. So that can be improvement with HR 40. And I'll be perfectly honest. I'm not really, a, the HR 40 is probably like the farthest I go politically and practically. If people want to support that and go to Sheila Jackson Lee's uh, website. But uh, beyond that, my only other solution that's practical to me is again, Refer to the website of uh, ADOS, American Descendants of Slavery, where they break down the trillions of dollars that, is, that have been sure. Dr. Claude Anderson, who was kind of like the forefather of that before groups like ADOS and FBA Foundational Black Americans. Their tact is, here's another tact. Uh, their tact is perhaps identifying uh, these descendants, these Black Americans, they call them Foundational Black Americans, as their own really specific nation. Interesting tact, the way the uh, Native Americans are identified as their own nation. And thus, while crappy reparations they got, you know, we could talk about, you know, how terrible the res, the res is, but how they were able to get some uh, funds diverted specifically for Native Americans was because they declared themselves as a separate nation. So right. that's, a, that's what these other groups are talking that, That's another strategy. Black people, you know, descendants of slaves, perhaps even here before the slave ships, we're, we're a different entirely race entity with another flag and thus entitled to it. So sometimes some people think that aspect is easier. It's just it's just it's just another uh, it's just another means to approach a problem. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think it's um, 
Well, it's telling it, uh, you know, sort of what you were saying about declaring yourself a nation. It, uh, it, did, it did remind me, I know that there's a, a, a public enemy album title. Uh, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. And uh, I think that uh, it's, it's such a succinct way to say like, yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. That's what, that's what we're talking about basically. And, you know, uh, holding back black Americans and, uh, you know, it's like the, like we said, the native Americans and so many other things, uh, obviously we could stay on this, but, uh, there was a comment in the chat that I thought uh, is going to tie into a couple of other things. Uh, our pal storage yard residents. So when this nation has a one party system, well, if you be happy, I'll speak for myself. I would not be happy with a one party system. However, if people voted and the votes were counted and then there was one party in power and maybe it wasn't Republicans, maybe it wasn't Democrats. Maybe that's, maybe it's the, the bull moose party comes back. Maybe the Whigs come back. Uh, if, if that's the way people vote and look, we've had time where we've had one party rule, not that there aren't any other parties, you know, it, it, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, you know, Donald Trump had the house and the Senate when, uh, he was first president and then he lost all three of those. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's why we're talking about these election rights things. Uh, I wanted to let you weigh in on that first, uh, Scott, uh, sort of this idea that, uh, we, we would have a one party system. We've had one party systems at time. Now, I think that what storage yard is talking about would be, you know, 100 Democrats in the Senate, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't think you'll ever get that. But uh, just the, the idea that uh, I, I don't think that that's what we were saying we wanted. We're just sort of saying that we can kind of see some places where the majority seems to be shifting, you know? Well, it, it, but the ironic thing, which I love Storrs Yard Resident because he's, he's been here from the beginning, but the ironic thing is that's exactly what Republicans are trying to do. <laughs> that's exactly what they've been trying to do. <laughs> By putting the voter suppression in, they're trying to cling to power and they're trying to keep Republican governments in place across the majority of these states that they know are slipping away from them. So the ironic thing is that's what they're doing right now. Um, so, and that's exactly the Republicans MO. It's like, put, put the blame on everyone else. Uh, and don't watch what we're actually doing over here. Cause that's a, that's what they would love to do. And they'd love to install Trump as their fearless leader uh, if they could. So that's, um, uh, that, that's where it's kind of ironic. And of course, nobody wants a one party system, but what we want is two healthy parties. I mean, we wish we had more parties here and a parliamentary type of setup like you have in other parts of the world. It might work out better to some degree, but we're stuck with two parties at this point. So we need two healthy parties. And that is when the losing party, which were the Republicans in 2020, would be a strong opposition party. That's good for this country. But when you have a party that is trying to restrict voters and have an authoritarian streak and putting up on a pedestal a failed loser criminal liar uh that's not healthy for democracy so like you said if people are allowed to vote freely and openly and conveniently and they vote for a one-party system and they voted for 100 senators they're all one party then that's that's the way that people voted um and that would be part of a healthy democracy when you give people the best ability to go out and vote and make it as easy as possible let the voters have the participation and that's who they choose to vote for well then the other party needs to come up with better ideas and 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 run better candidates um and and so absolutely um but it is ironic because that's exactly what republicans are attempting to do you know, uh, Al, I have uh, I, I have a, uh, a handful of uh, one one in particular, one friend of mine who's uh, she's my friend is really actually on this show in the very beginning. Uh, she is black and she's not conservative, but she liked Trump in a lot of ways. And she would always say that why does you know just sort of as a whole why do, why do black folks just vote for Democrats because they always had. And why the, the follow-up question I always have is, well, why are Republicans not so active? I mean, when you think of the, the deep South and how red those states are, well, what's, you know, how huge are, are the African-American population in those states? Why aren't you uh, doing better by them and trying to, you know, it's like you can, the, you can always point to Tim Scott. You can point to a few elected officials but it's like yeah but your majority of voters you're not you're not courting them and do you feel like there you know there is a way for if republicans 
would just have some degree of better outreach and like, well, let's listen. I mean, you know, President Trump did meet, you know, uh, I think it was even before he uh, was sworn in, you know, he met with a, a lot of uh, black leaders, you know, you'll see some of those, those steps. Uh, you, they're not usually reflected in legislation, but what do you think about the viability of, you know, Republicans? Look, there's the conservative values. There are going to be no shortage of, you say any ethnic group in this country, there are going to be plenty of people who have uh, some very conservative values about a lot of things. Uh, do you think that there's just a systematic problem from within the party where they're like, yeah, but we, we're not going to really, you know, we'll, we'll do some token things here and there within our state, but we're not really going to, as a, as a party, try to do, do anything for that community. There's definitely a symptomatic problem in the Republican party. And I'm going to circle back and answer that question specific, starting with the notion that as a self-hating liberal or a very critical Democrat of somebody, you know, because some people think, oh, you hate the Democrats. And I always end up voting for a Democrat. I voted for Obama, voted for Biden, got the vaccine, all the things, you know, that uh, someone like me isn't necess necessarily. By the way, just to, j just to jump in, my same friend that I'm talking about will not get vaccinated, by the way. She's like, <laughs> nope, I don't trust it. And I, so I anyway. Fought tooth, yeah, yeah. And I fought two to nail against it too, by the way. But I think she has a good point in that, um, in that black people have been too unilaterally and dare I say emotionally tied to the uh, Democratic Party. And a lot of that gets locked in with, again, the financial support of the gatekeepers, the, you know, the people on MSNBC, the Al Sharptons, you know, these people who really control who gets the platform and who gets to reach a lot of people. Because I'll be the first person to say, I have no problem with you if you're quote, Republican, and you follow Republican values, you know, there's an argument to be made, you know, you believe in less taxes. I have no problem with that. You believe perhaps in a smaller government in, in certain areas. Uh, reasonable people can disagree. What I have a problem with is this, this, the Trumpster, the Trump existence, which has really been a wing of the part of Republican Party, probably dating back to Nixon, you know, in the, the Southern uh, strategy. Uh, that has always been feed the racist, you know, red meat. So it's always kind of been there. Um, but is there a way back? I think so too, because a lot of, there's a lot of uh, people, uh, not just my generation, but in the millennial generation, and this is again, what my film is uh, Occupy Black is, uh, is broaching, is that there's a movement developing on the internet where black people, what they call, will vote B1, black first. And it's just short for vote for your interests the way everyone else does. Because one of the things, uh, uh, let's say the uh, we talk about the Latino community, very diverse voting block, you know, especially like, let's say in Florida, you know, obviously tend to vote more conservative, you know, probably anti-immigration versus uh, the Hispanic voting block, you know, in California, though you still have that aspect. I think if the black community was, was didn't vote so monolithically for Democrats, or if at least we had specific unified goals that weren't tied to the Democrats, we could have more leverage. In other words, have the Democrats and the Republicans both coming to us. If you want our disproportionate vote, which they claim every election, including the last one, where the turnout of the black vote all the way down to Atlanta was able to swing things as well as, you know, get us, you know, seats in Congress. If we are so powerful, and exercise this, and our people vote disproportionately for Democrat and, and sway these elections, many of uh, largely black women, you know, let's say at the tipping point, let's say of getting Biden in, in power, why don't we wield that power more effectively as opposed to, i.e., what a lot of the, the black Congress and BLM uh, did was pledge their vote for uh, Biden for the Democrats without requesting anything in return. A lot of the things that we've, you know, I've, I've talked about here, not just not just reparations and, and, and things for the community, but more specifically, don't don't lock in your agenda with one party with the Democrat agenda, because anything that's going to be that you think is your, I, I'm one of those people kind of old school. I'm like, I want everybody to be taken care of. I believe love, happiness, help your neighbor, whoever that neighbor is, doesn't matter the color, creed, religion. But because I was born in, you know, Baldwin Hills, Crenshaw District, Los Angeles, I tend to help that community first. Like kind of like take care of that your backyard first before you can be a good partner. 
And I think black people need to look at their of uh, their voting habits first. Let's t let's let's look at our own interests first, because there's so many other groups that look at their own interests first without necessarily pledging to get them watered down by a Democrat or Republican. Guess what? I don't not that I think what Trump would ever do anything out of the good of his heart to, bro to, to help black people. But guess what? If it was in his political interest, if he thought he needed that extra bit, he'll do the, you know, like the uh, lip service, reach out to rappers and stuff. But if he really thought it would benefit him, I think he would. Uh, uh, I think he would probably eject, inject, let's say, a lot of money into black uh, financial institutions, businesses and banks real, or real estate, because supposedly that's his wheelhouse, though he's, you know, a failed real estate guy. But things like that, that that you could talk his language and that he could appreciate. But if we say, hey, you do this specifically for our community, you know, we may not necessarily be tied to vote to Democrats. And ultimately, I think you win by using your leverage against both parties and in, in getting the best offer made. Uh, just an interesting comment from a friend, Sam Whitfield, uh, wanted to know how you would feel about working with black conservatives like Candace Owens or James Golden. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that. It's very interesting. Um, I wouldn't have a problem with working with black conservatives, but I'm going to give you the perfect example the, of what the problem is with the Candace Owens. When we talk about, you know, someone who's a measured intellectual representative of conservatism, versus somebody, you know, who's a, a bomb thrower from the right or the left. And she's a bomb thrower. And let's call it what it is. She talked to, she started this whole thing about, I forget what it was. It wasn't Brexit, but it was the equivalent of Brexit for black people to go vote Democrat. I mean, to go vote Republican because she used to be a Democrat. Yeah. I think, again, that shows how steeped in the, the two party system or just the system she is itself and what she's missing. And I'm going to use an example that Malcolm X used, and it's a and it's a radical example, but and it doesn't necessarily apply literally, but applies figuratively. Why would you move from one plantation to another plantation? Well, why not manage your own destiny and be your own boss and political will? So I wouldn't tie myself to uh, specifically to the Republicans and especially to a, blonde, a, a bomb thrower like uh, Candace Owens, who's basically who's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't think she's in it necessarily for the uh, for the betterment of black people. I think a lot of it is, you know, clout chasing. Well, it's a, it, it's a lot of, it's a lot of self-promotion. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a great comparison is with, uh, with Ann Coulter who, you know, it's a little quiet right now, but usually every, every few months she would say something in an interview that she knew would get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And yep. when her book was about to come out, she would do a lot more interviews like that. And she would say things that she probably didn't mean, but it didn't matter because it's like, oh, look, we're talking about her. So, yeah, there, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think I, I do understand what your point is, sort of the distinction. I think that uh, it's sort of like half an answer to Sam is yes, sure, working with black conservatives, just maybe uh, not those two. And he agrees with you. She is definitely a clout chaser. <laughs> uh, Scott, I did want to uh, get your thoughts sort of on, you know, any, a, a, any, any, uh, desire you think within the Republican party to have an outreach like this on a large scale, you know, just like, yeah, why are we not trying to get more, uh, you know, more black voters in a presidential election? And, you know, there, it's not, it's not like 0% voted for Trump. I believe more voted for him in 2020 than did in 2016. Yeah. Uh, it's just the, the overall turnout was so much larger that it actually didn't matter. Correct. And, and there are certainly, uh, folks in the Republican Party that do want it to broaden their appeal because they do see the writing on the wall. And I think they honestly, as you know, a, a healthy, vibrant party, like we said earlier, that has ideas and can be either a good opposition party when they lose and, and be a good leadership party when they win, um, they would want more voices in the party because when you narrow down the voices, and especially like we said, and I said this going back to 2016, the strategy of, of going after this dwindling base that Trump has is going to continue to shrink as time goes on. And you could see he had his rabid base, but it wasn't enough to take him the victory. And it really didn't in 2016, except by a fluke. Um, and you saw the Democrats won by major numbers in 2018 in the House. And, and so going after that strategy is not going to win the long run. But we did see, you know, especially for Latino voters, that was a huge increase for the Republicans in places that were very much had gone for the Democrats in deep South Texas, for instance, around the border. Uh, Miami-Dade County, 
was a huge Democratic bastion for Florida. And that would be the location that would be sort of ground zero to help tip the state over to the Democrats. And it went hugely over uh, in the Latino vote to uh, to Donald Trump in 2020, which helped solidify him uh, winning the state overall. So I, most uh, Republicans, if they're smart, are going to try to do that that outreach. And they've started, uh, especially the Latino vote in 2020. And Trump tried a bit in 2016 and as as president, uh, but more just, you know, to get their votes. But and we've talked about this in the past. There has been a lot of lip service. And and, and as Al brought, brought up, which is a good point that them, Democrats have done and sort of just taken the black vote for granted over the years as well and sure. do a little bit of lip service for. I mean, everybody does that. But, you know, there should be a strategic effort as well as the Democrats not to just rest on that and continue to outreach and do the important things that really will make a difference for the black community that so desperately needs it and not just provide more lip service. But, you know, there is a certain faction of the Republican Party right now that's never going to want to open it up because they're going to continue to go after the dwindling conservative white base. That is, I don't want to say they're all racist, but, you know, they want to go after that vote that will go out and, and, and vote for them and show up for them as long as they can, they think they can hold on to that. Christian, can I chime in here? Just double Absolutely. Yeah. And what Scott said basically is we want to see substantive change instead of window dressing. Mm -hmm. And even to a certain extent, uh, you know, inclusion is a big thing. And so, and it's a wonderful thing. But so many times inclusion doesn't translate into an agenda, i.e., we talked about this probably on your last show, Kamala Harris. You know, I one of the reasons I voted for Biden was for Kamala. I want to see a black woman in there, you know, slow change. But we know by, for instance, her policy, as well as Biden, they were both flawed candidates as far as concerning, you know, the prison industrial complex and uh, how Kamala locked up a lot of black folks for uh for let's say low level weed violations. And we know how Biden, you know, voted, you know, back in, uh, back in the eighties crime bill. So these are problematic candidates. And a lot of times what we get is, is, is the window dressing, but we need the window dressing in the inclusion to be a uh, substantive. Uh, there was another example I was, I was going to give, but, but um, we see it so many times. And I think that's what, uh, what Scott was alluding to down from having Cardi B or a rapper meet with Biden, you know, which, right. which is instead of having like a, a like I said, a Dr. Claude Anderson or a true black economist meet with them, you know, but that's not the way the gatekeepers want it. They don't want to have that conversation. Uh, a couple other things I want to talk about before uh, we finish up, uh, you know, it's uh, we're talking about elections and uh, we talk about uh, former President Trump's uh, efforts uh, in the uh, the weeks and months after the 2020 election. Uh, it's uh, been circulating that uh, reportedly he has been telling people that uh, he will be reinstated as president by August, despite the fact that there is there's no system in place where that would ever happen. Uh, the 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 what I was reading was that he's very smart and that he's not saying it publicly himself, but he'll, you know, all of a sudden, uh, Sid Sidney Powell's back on speed dial and she was talking about it in an event. Uh, but it just more of like, uh, yeah, that's what they should do is, is what she was even saying. So no one's actually saying that this is going to happen, but you just sort of keep it out there. But the, the argument being that, uh, you know, if he did say it publicly, then you have all those people who are, you know, holding their nose and still, despite, you know, the attempt to overthrow the Capitol building that are still, you know, not speaking out against him and just sort of, you know, writing it out and seeing how it all plays out over the next few years. Eventually people would have to denounce him. It's like, well, now, now look, look at how crazy this guy is that uh, he thinks he's going to, uh, he's, he's going to get reinstated, uh, which is not a thing. Uh, but to to be fair, I think that the people that he's saying this to are the same people that tell him that, you know, he's back at his fighting weight of 202. So, you know, I think that most people who know him know not to uh, really take what he says seriously. But it it's more indicative of, you know, that this starts circulating around and it's like, yeah, this just this just isn't going to go away. So Republicans who do want to make the clean break, Scott, seem to be in the minority you know, that, uh, that there's still an effort, like, no, we need that. But mm -hmm. even conservatives will point out that, you know, your, your Trump voters turn out when Trump's on the ballot, you know, so if he's not running, it, 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 they're, they're not going to vote you out because he doesn't like you, 
You know, there's like, what am I, I'm going to go vote in some midterm primary because Trump doesn't like a guy, you know? Uh, I, and, and I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, I, I thought that maybe we were going to see it uh, once uh, the new administration was sworn in. But uh, why do you think it's so difficult for them to uh, have a clean break for so many of them? It's not zero, but it's the majority of them uh, are afraid to, to make this break, Scott. Yeah, it's it's something that is uh, mind boggling for the ages. I mean, you could you could read into again some of the reasons why uh, they're so attached to him. Not so much that they like him, but again, like you said, they like the fact that these voters and a lot of them were new voters came out passionately, and they feel that there's still something to be said for those voters and retaining them. But you know, when you look back and you zoom out, you think, why? <laughs> <laughs> the man is a proven loser and yeah. he has done nothing to help broaden that party. Like we just said earlier to broaden the Republican party and, and, and allow new voters to come in besides, like we said, maybe some Latino voters that had voted democratic for years that were more on the conservative side. But other than that, you're not seeing them broaden at all. In fact, you're seeing it shrink and get smaller and smaller and he has done nothing but lose for them. And he is nothing but an overall distraction for them and by enabling him and his fantasies is just not healthy again for democracy in general and for like we say going back to George Yard residence thing a one party system because as i've said all along and I, I all you have to do is look out here to california to see what happens when republicans don't really look at the big picture down the road they become a, a nearly extinct party and that's what you're going to see in the longer term unless they wake up because here in california we are for all intents and purposes, a one-party state, because there is nobody that can broaden out and, and win in a statewide election here and ha have not uh, statewide since 2006. And you look back at the two senators and since the uh, 80s. So yeah. it, it's not a good sign for the Republican Party in general when they, when they do those sort of things. And it, it's going to take a, a, a huge landslide loss for them with Trump-enabled voters on there for them to possibly wake up and be like, he really is the loser and you know that he is and we need to separate ourselves from him but until they really feel that they're going to lose in this strategy they're going to keep clinging on as long as possible to continue to get those voters that they think they're going to get can i ask you guys a question scott and christian yeah um, absolutely and it's along the lines of what scott brought up as far as uh you know we what our perception of uh the republicans you know going down with the trump ship in spite of themselves i always question this and it's more it's I said, is it that much emotion that has the, the party, the Republican Party, so tied to Trump because of this emotional representation of he represents, you know, we're losing everything, you know, the, the minorities are, are taking my job and inclusion and we have gays, you know, here in these powerful positions and he's letting there, everyone wants to let immigrants get my job before I get it. Is the emotional tie to that so extreme? I guess, or is it, or is it something else besides emotion? Maybe it taps into something that it taps into. I guess this this right wing populism, I suppose, has always been there. But I feel like the Trumpism. I guess I'm asking, how did it get to that much emotional? So emotionally tied. You know, it's because also confluence of Ob Obama, the first black president and a, a pushback against that. I don't know. This is really it's really. It, yeah. I mean, I think it was a it was a it was a sort of just a direct reaction to Obama, you know, was like, well, now we're, we're getting this. And, uh, you know, which sort of, you know, you you have a, a, a you have a president who wasn't denouncing things that uh, presidents of both parties typically did, you know. Uh, you know, just uh, not not wanting to rule out, uh, you know, n not accepting the endorsement of, uh, uh, you know, of clan members of the Proud Boys and those <laughs> things, but also just playing like, I, I don't know anything about them. But, you know, it's like, I don't know anything about QAnon, but I think that they're against pedophiles. All right. So you do know something about them, you know. So, you know, there, there's a lot of that. Uh, and I think it's it, but you, you, you had the key word there. It's mostly emotional. You know, it was like, yeah, this guy gets us. And there are probably some, not, not all, not, not many of them, but there's enough that are you know, people who maybe shouldn't be gotten by anybody, 
especially in the elected official. I don't know, Scott, what do you think it is beyond yeah. emotions? No, I mean, Al, you're absolutely right. There's now it's, it's the, 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 the older straight white male that is playing the victim now that feels their lifestyle is being turned away. And instead of looking at themselves again, which is the Republican philosophy, right? You're, you're supposed to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, but instead you're blaming everyone else for your own issues. You're blaming globalism. You're blaming the minorities. You're blaming uh, the immigrants coming across the supposed wall, why you have to build a 50 foot wall in Mexico because they're coming and stealing the jobs and they're, you know, and, and you're blaming everybody else but your own self. And and Trump came in and wrote on that. And again, a lot of Democrats got complacent after eight years with Obama because even President Obama had said, uh, there was a whole thing with Ezra Klein with his podcast saying, you know, racism and, and tapping into that vein is no longer an issue anymore. We're a diverse country, we've moved on. And that was, you know, back at the beginning, uh, middle of his first term, which again was proven wrong. And that's sort of why we did this whiplash by going back with someone who was the opposite of, of President Obama, with someone who just people thought, like you said, Christian is, you know, relates to us as one of us or whatever, which again is also comical considering uh, Trump you know, never had to do hard work or struggle for a job because he just got money from his dad. Um, it's just kind of, again, comical that they would look to this person, um, yeah, a serial the, bank rupper, a person who doesn't run any of his businesses well as someone to look up to. And you could say, you know, Mark Burnett and all, all the stuff with Apprentice helped make a fake look of him looking like a real business person. Um, but it is ironic that people look to that, a failed multiple bankrupt loser as someone to emulate or think that is one of them when he's not. But yeah. you're right, they're playing the victim and they want to now blame everybody else, but actually do the, the hard work, re-educate themselves, look for new jobs, figure out that yes, this country is changing, but if you embrace it, it's changing for the better. And you should be along for the ride to, to embrace that and not feel that you're a victim and that you will now as an older straight white male never have um, the privilege that you've grown accustomed to, which wasn't something you know technically you should have had to begin with so it's uh time to grow up and move on and and embrace uh, the new yeah. uh, america that it will be so well and, and sam does make the point that trump was a reaction to clinton as in hillary uh yeah i mean i think uh most uh, trump supporters feel like most other democrats on a national level would have successfully beaten trump in 2016. it was a very visceral reaction to like we can't follow up this obama guy that we didn't like with her who we've hated for like, you know, most of our adult lives because of how long she had been around. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, that that played a big part of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, we uh, we always appreciate having you on, Sam. And yes, you're right. We should uh, have you on the show at some point, uh, actually uh, speak with us. Uh, but we always appreciate being in the chat. Uh, the final thing I wanted to talk about was uh, that uh, – it's it's Pride Month, and uh, how did uh, Ron DeSantis uh, commemorate this yesterday, Scott? I don't think I need to to tell you. Uh, what did Ron DeSantis decide to do to commemorate Pride Month? The yes, start of to it. be able to 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 be able on on day one and uh, restrict uh, trans uh, youth and sports uh, right away, and yeah. Yeah, and he, also get rid of mental health uh, issues uh, for the survivors of the Pulse nightclub shooting as well. Um, they had the state had to help provide mental health services for people with PTSD that are recovering from the shooting, which also happened this month. The anniversary is coming up in less than two weeks and it'll be the five year anniversary and uh, also did that as well. And, you know, we talked about this. He wants to be the, the, the kinder, gentler Trump that he's trying to set up his, his uh, run for potentially for the presidency in 2024, but doing these type of things aren't even necessary because if you're a Republican and you're a Trump supporter, you're going to vote for him. So to do those things are just yeah. cruel and there was no reason for it at all. Yeah. And I mean, the, the pulse thing in particular, I mean, it, it's, it's your state dummy, you know, I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. these are people who, uh, you know, whatever you run for could vote for you. And now they, you know, it's, it, it, yeah. And it's, it's why he's not a kinder, gentler Trump. He's like a, a mini Trump or a Trump light. Uh, Trump at least has people around him who are like, you, you can't sign this on the first day of Pride Month. You go ahead and sign it at the end of May, you know, if you feel like that's something that you're trying to get out of voters, or you can wait till July. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I think that uh, he is this guy that clearly has national aspirations, but you just mm -hmm. look at him and you're like, really him? You know, mm -hmm. and look, 
uh, is we're in a very different spot on June 2nd, 2021 than we were June 2nd, 2020. And uh, there are plenty of people that will say, uh, see, he was right with the, the COVID restrictions. And uh, I think that uh, you know there are some uh, family members of people who passed away who might feel differently, but his approach towards things in Florida was uh, is where places like uh, New York and New Jersey. I know New Jersey uh, eased most mask restrictions uh, last at the end of last week, and I know New York's coming soon. California, we're just a couple weeks away, so I, I understand that uh, he feels like he's got this momentum, but. Uh, I always feel like it just comes down to a name a lot of time and just DeSantis. It's like, <laughs> does that sound American to you? And, and I, I, I don't say that to, to, to either of you. I just say to, you know, just for like a, for somebody that would be running against him in a primary DeSantis. Is that what you want? So yeah, I don't, I don't know what his approach should be. Uh, but I, I know, uh, Sam, uh, I don't know if Sam, if you're in Florida now, I know you were in Florida at one point. He's a, he is a DeSantis guy and we can talk about him. Uh, I understand that there is appeal to him, but if you want to be a national candidate, you, you sort of have to play you you have to play a different, uh, ball game, you know, than uh, than you do, uh, even a big state, even an important, uh, electoral vote, rich state, like, uh, like, uh, Florida. Well, so, he's got to get through the election next year because I saw Nikki Fried is also running now for governor, and she's the only statewide uh, Democrat in the state of Florida. Uh, so, you know, he's got to get through next year to begin with. And not to say he won't because Florida's trends in red, and we've had Republican governors sure. around going back to, to Jeb Bush in 98 uh, when he was elected. Uh, so it's been over 20 years of, of continuous Republican uh, rule there, talking about one party state. But um, he still has to get through that, and that should be his focus right now and then he can talk about it because a losing one-term governor wouldn't play well for running for national office yeah and, and, and by the way even uh even before uh, all of the uh, allegations and before the uh the 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 scandal of the nursing homes i i didn't think cuomo was a national candidate either you know there are mm -hmm. there are, you know it's a his dad never sought uh national office there's a certain level that's like well you know you know where your skeletons can stay in the closet up until a level. And then when you go for that next step, I think a lot of people uh, felt like that's why uh, Rudy Giuliani uh, got out of the presidential race uh, because he got a headache flying over uh, Missouri, I believe. Uh, it was just one thing too many with his, you know, his wife had had a separate uh, seat for her purse or something. You know, there are people who are suited for national politics, and then there are people who it's like sometimes don't don't go for the brass ring. You know, what? don't 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 go for the gold. You know, bronze is pretty great too. Christian, let me ask you though. You brought up a great point because Cuomo has been out of the press. You know, since of you know everything that's been going on in the media cycle, and really, I think he's probably like thanking God on his knees that Matt Gates came into the picture. Let me yeah. ask you guys another question: Is uh, are Cuomo's um, improper actions? That's all I've seen. But I haven't. Perhaps there may be a, a rape charge out there. I don't know. But so far, I've seen they've seemed to be like inappropriate behavior or groping, which you can even perhaps label as a sexual assault. You know, wherever they are in the spectrum. But because he's not paying, you know, underage prostitutes, yeah, does that him perhaps give him? Uh, a reprieve or put him in, in a different political light or is he still done? I, I think that, uh, you know, look, he's not on a, he's not on a ballot, you know, so it helps. Uh, but I think that uh, the, you know, there, there were people that are calling for him to resign. And I think that that decision of like, now we're just going to wait this out. Uh, you know, and I don't, I, I don't, I haven't lived in New York in a long time. I still have a lot of uh, friends and family who do. Uh, people aren't talking about it that much because it's like, do you want to go to the grocery store again? Do you want to go to the movies? Yeah, you don't have to wear masks. Uh, do you want to go? You want to sit in a restaurant? Great. You want to go to a baseball game? Do that. You want to go to Madison Square Garden and, and watch the Knicks lose a playoff game? You can do that too. So it's almost like, and and you know, it's what people are saying about Newsom here. It's like, well, you want to do all your stuff? Go great, do your stuff. And then you kind of don't remember, like, wait, what didn't I like about this guy? Uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that. Uh, it, it, you know, whether if from a moral standpoint, uh, you know, whether he's a good guy or not, that's not the issue from a political standpoint for him to just wait it out was the right political decision. What do you think uh, about that uh, regarding Cuomo, Scott? 
I mean, I agree. And to, to Al's point, it's like, it, it's kind of fascinating that here were even the, the national Democrats, the two U.S. senators from the state of New York that were asking for him to resign and he, he's written it out. And at this point, he could run again. Uh, I believe it's his fourth term uh, next year. I, I wouldn't put it past him. Uh, so, you know, he's written through a lot of criticism beyond the nursing home debacle and the other issues that he's had to his personal issues here the, that, that are ongoing that he has written it out. And he's now taken a page from the playbook from Governor Ralph Northam, who slightly different in Virginia because they can't run for consecutive terms, but he took that page and just said, okay, I'm not going to resign and I'm going to write it out. And, and you see a lot of politicians are doing that now. And it tended to be more of a Republican thing. A lot of Democrats, the first drop of a pin and they were out. Um, but you start to see Democrats now taking that page from Republicans started with Ralph Northam. And now you're seeing it yeah. with, with Cuomo. Yeah, I mean, we 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 all saw those pictures of Ralph Northam in blackface, and it was like, well, that guy's done. And it's like, well, really, that was actually a while ago, and, and no, he's not. Yeah, and to your point, Scott, and we've said this before, you know, every time one of these things happens, Al Franken just shakes his head and goes, "What was that?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Like, exactly. I should have taken a vacation, gone on a cruise with my family, and then come back. Even Katie know? Hill, I mean, she yeah. could have. I mean, and, and, and again, I think it was slightly uh, unfairly put more pressure on a woman in that position. Yeah. Uh, but even she could have written it out. And, and, you know, now we've seen that go back to the Republicans by a razor thin 330 vote margin that could have stayed in Democratic hands as well. So you, you do see that. And, and I think the, the bigger picture is you're going to see more politicians now saying what's in the best interest, not just for my own survival, but for the party's survival, too. And you're going to see more of this like, well, we're, I'm going to refuse to resign. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Well, uh, Al, we talked about a lot of uh, topics that weren't necessarily fun, but it is always fun getting to uh, chat with you. Thank you for coming on. And uh, please take a moment and remind everyone uh, where they can find your work and how they can keep in touch with you on social media. Oh, thank you so much for having me again, Christian. It's good seeing you again, Scott. Everybody, uh, yeah. you can keep up with everything I have going on on OccupyBlack.com or on Twitter at Jamaica House Doc. And just a gentle reminder, uh, the screening that's currently going on virtually with the first incarnation of Occupy Black is going on at culturela.org slash reimagine, culturela.org slash reimagine. Or if you just go to culture.la or culturela.org, you'll be able to find it. That's it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Al, and uh, good luck with the film. And we can't wait to hear about uh, the 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 next installments. And uh, Scott, where can people find you, as always? Right here at Sman eighty. That's Sman eight zero on Twitter. And uh, you know, you might see me uh, call out Ken McCarthy or Mitch McConnell or one of them at some point when, <laughs> when I have some time. <laughs> do you, Do you think they might say something stupid? Is it? Is it <laughs> I know it's shocking, right? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just a possibility. Uh, and as always, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian DMZ. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the Blackcast YouTube channel. We have this show and we have the weekly Blackcast, which is a mixture of interviews and uh, just fun conversations about uh, pop culture. And we also have our show, uh, Marvel Movie Talk, which uh, will be moving to Wednesdays next week, a week from today. And we will begin uh, recapping each episode of of the Disney Plus Loki series that's about to start. So please find us there. Uh, thanks again to Scott and Al and uh, our apologies to Tamara because we were not able to get the tech worked out, but you saw even I got kicked off. So I don't know. I don't know. Oh, we gotta, Tamara. We got to get, get a whole overhaul here uh, and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully the tech will be better by the time we're back with everyone next week. Uh, thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you 